Welcome back to this special edition of 12 Days in March. As we all endure the ravages of the COVID pandemic, I thought students might appreciate some tricks of the trade that have pulled out of the educational vault. In this series of presentations, rather than focusing on content, I will review the key lessons learned in dealing with the NBME over the last 10 years. Make no mistake about it, this is the substance of my individual tutoring sessions and can largely be viewed as a prequel to use of the QBanks. And to be clear, the observations that I share derive from innumerable hours spent in one-on-one -on -one sessions with medical students. During these sessions, I sat and peered over their shoulders, witnessing the thought processes and approaches while working through dozens of NBME-style vignettes. I could not have discovered these lessons without their openness and willing participation. To each student, I am grateful. We will be returning to this slide shortly, but did you ever watch one of those movies where they start at the end and go back in time? For reasons that will become obvious, I grab some popcorn and sit back as we start with the conclusion of this series. So where are we? We're actually at the end. We're at the end because all the roads led right here to the integration of content. And how did that happen? Well, the first lesson that we all agreed to is that QBanks are for learning, not testing. The whole house of cards depends on this little nugget of information. We learn the difference between active and passive learning and how active learning leads to improved retention of material. We learn that QBanks are not for testing and that they represent an educational tool referred to as problem-based learning, which is a form of active learning. We learn that the ultimate goal is to build your intellectual scaffolding so information will be readily available on test day. We learn that your notes do matter. We learn the importance of culling and refining them, focusing on classic associations and key language that will bail you out of clinical vignettes when the answers are not readily apparent. I've given you permission to reference your notes or other resources when you're in a jam. The process of exploring references during the act of problem solving leads to better retention of material while having the secondary benefit of helping you realize just how close you are to greatness. We entered the QBank and discovered the reinforcing benefits of one organ system at a time and one subdivision at a time. We looked at the folly and chaos of doing random questions and how randomness interferes with the cementing of knowledge. We looked at the importance of note-taking and the reinforcing benefits of the student becoming the educator, lecturing to your pets or anyone else that will listen. And by the way, this is Shakespeare, and he loves to listen to medical lectures, especially when delivered by medical students preparing for step one. We took a deep dive into the question stem and spent a good deal of time weighing the relative merits of data demographics, and the physical exam. We focused on the importance of the NBME language even over content. That is, you can be very familiar with content, but if you can't speak the language of the NBME, you'll be dead in the water. We talked about negative information and how the absence of findings and or information can actually be quite informative. And finally, we spoke about the pace and rhythm of question review in order to maximize the efficiency and value you derive from the use of the QBanks. We emphasize the most important mantra, one question at a time. And if you pay attention to the key concepts buried in these videos, you will integrate abundant amounts of information that will be readily available at your fingertips, and you too can score 260 on test day, not because of some miracle or supernatural event, but because you worked your tails off, but did it with focus and efficiency. And that, my friends, is how the game is played. Hello, and welcome back to the beginning. Are you ready? As I mentioned earlier, these observations all derive from spending countless hours working one-on-one -on -one with medical students. And let me offer a couple of quick caveats. The first is this, no two students are alike. Whereas there are some common traits, each student is unique, often discovering very clever ways of getting themselves into trouble. The other major caveat is this, I am sharing information that derives from the trials and tribulations of students who have struggled to gain traction on their test scores. Whereas these lessons are generalizable, they should have particular relevance to those who are struggling to optimize their test performance. And to be clear, these suggestions are not intended to be a quick or miraculous fix. In fact, there is no such thing. Instead, you will hear a series of recommendations that will help you achieve success commensurate with all the time and effort you put into step one preparation. And here's our first summary. Each student is unique. And this series is written for the benefit of those who are struggling to achieve step one success. 
And now to take a step back, here is the broad overview of what we'll be covering in these videos, including general principles, analysis of the question stem, and the question options, and do note, these are two different beasts. Then we'll turn our attention to maximizing QBank efficiency, or what I'll describe as best practices, and finally, the whole purpose of this exercise is for you to integrate a voluminous curriculum that will ultimately be assessed on test day. So it isn't enough to read or study material. You need to have it at your fingertips where you can recall key facts as you plow through 280 questions on test day. All right, returning to the general principles, and to be clear, I will not be presenting the Ten Commandments. Instead, I am offering you approaches and recommendations that are intended to be practiced again and again and again, especially when you are taking the deep dive into the QBanks. You need to develop good and healthy and productive habits while going through practice questions in the QBank. After all, isn't that what practice is? Which brings me to my old running adage. Your race time is not determined on race day. It is a reflection of all the training runs that preceded the race, and so it will be on step one. Your test score will not reflect the hours of hard work, but the quality of your preparation. And that is the purpose of this series, to highlight a high quality, efficient training program as you prepare for your big race. And make no mistake about it, this is a marathon and not a quick sprint. So this material is not intended to be viewed once and forgotten. The purpose is to create a study program that can be practiced over and over and over again. Now we've all heard the line, I guess you had to be there. I acknowledge up front that these lessons might make more sense if I caught you red-handed in the act of committing NBME sins, but since I can't have one-on-one -on -one sessions with everyone, all I can do is offer you this roadmap. You'll have to pick and choose the recommendations that work best for you. If you ultimately need more help or attention, you know where to find me. So when all is said and done, the most important outcome of these exercises will be to help you lift words and thoughts from the written page into your mind's eye. That is the ultimate goal. You only get to take fond memories into step one, not your first aid manual with all those notes scribbled in the margins. We need to get this information into your noggin. Did you get that? My goal is for you to develop habits that will take that voluminous quantity of medical information off the written page and get it into your working memory, where it will be available on test day. We'll get into the particulars shortly, but let me finish the general principles. And here's an obvious one, but time really is finite. No matter how hard you work, and you do work hard, you only have so much time to prepare. If you are struggling to cover the major topics, it is perfectly reasonable to make executive decisions and let the lesser or more peripheral material fall by the wayside. As this series proceeds, we'll help you sort out the big ticket items versus the esoterica. I like to use this chest wall compliance curve as an example. If you spend hours trying to make heads or tails of this curve, that is time stolen from basic pharmacology or microbiology that you are more likely to encounter on test day. There does come a point of diminishing returns. It is okay to pick and choose where and how you spend your time. You could always return to more esoteric material down the road if the need and opportunity arises. Insofar as learning resources, there are too many, but it is vitally important for you to make a distinction between primary learning sources and review manuals and materials. Too many students try to learn from review manuals without ever having learned the primary material. It doesn't work, or should I say, it may work, but it is very inefficient. This is a common and often fatal flaw with cardiology. You are not alone if you struggle with the complexities of cardiology. Many students do. But if students invested a couple of days relearning cardiac physiology from a primary resource, then pathophysiology, pathology, and pharmacology will all fall into place. So the take-home general principle here is this. There is a time for review and a time for primary learning. Only you can make that distinction. But if you are struggling in an organ system, or isolated topic, don't be afraid to go back to the primary resource. It will save you time and energy in the long run. The better you understand a topic, the easier it will be to integrate the content for test day. Don't take shortcuts. It doesn't pay off. And finally, before getting into the weeds, you need to discover the joy of organizing diseases and disorders into broad categories. It is impossible to develop mastery of medical information without a categorical approach. As I readily admit, I am too old to memorize anything. My grasp of material is purely based on the ability to recognize broad categories and, of course, the NBME language that cues you in. 
Pictured here is my intellectual scaffolding and a quick thumbnail sample of the glomerulopathies. Keep it simple. Be able to distinguish nephritic from nephrotic. Within those categories, the individual disorders will flow more readily. In this instance, I've created additional categories such as IgA nephropathy versus post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. They cluster together. How do I know that? It becomes apparent as I work my way through the QBanks. Make up your own categories, but the bottom line is that you need to organize the chaos. From that organization flows the diagnoses and a predictable set of derivatives that you'll need to be acquainted with in order to achieve step one success. All right, those were the general principles. Let's break up the discussion here before moving on to the question stem and ultimately on to answer options. Before adjourning, in these two slides, I offer a summary of the general principles just covered. And as always, if you have any questions or concerns about any of this material, please email me at 12days.